When Kingdom Come Deliverance first came out, it was a breath of fresh air for a game industry suffocating under the weight of its own contradictions. At a time when most big budget AAA games were playing it safe to replicate the commercial success of previous blockbuster hits, rehashing old IP after old IP and monetizing everything to hell, it was amazing to see an upcoming studio stake everything on a unique vision, one of historical accuracy, authenticity, and experimentation. In a way, it was the anti-AAA game, one targeted towards true gamers, not passive consumers. And this was reflected in its commitment to small details and interactivity over everything. Settlements were elaborately decorated with an abundance of color where needed, a massive contrast to the lazy Hollywood stereotype of the downtrodden peasant in rags with more mud than food that is still perpetuated in gaming, and standard NPCs would react to your actions in dynamic and unique ways that made you feel like you were just one piece of a much larger world. And fans reacted accordingly. Few games have a more passionate and committed community than Kingdom Come Deliverance. The internet is rife with love letters to the game, and I believe it will truly stand the test of time as a cult classic. But it never quite achieved the promise of its concept. Partly because of the insane jank, anyone who played the game in its first few years of release had to endure awkward animations. Jesus Christ be praised. How may I serve you? Absurd popping, glitches more common than textures, and extreme difficulty swings. But it was also let down by its story, mechanics, and overall narrative vision, which didn't quite match the scope and depth the developers obviously envisioned. So they had many problems to contend with and choices to make with the follow-up Kingdom Come Deliverance 2. Do we double down on the risk-taking and an innovative spirit of the original and in the process sacrifice playability and performance? Or do we use the resources now at our disposal to streamline, polish, and simplify to attract a broader AAA audience? Now, either way poses a lot of danger. If you really commit to the risk-taking experimental approach and don't really shift your vision from the original game, doubling down on the jank, then as Dragon's Dogma 2 absolutely demonstrates, things can go terribly wrong. At the same time, if you choose the safe option and follow the broader trends in the game industry, what once made your IP so distinctive can vanish quicker than you realize. And there were certainly warning signs that, that KCD2 was falling into this trap. We knew that the devs were intent on dramatically expanding the scope and scale of its settlements with the addition of Gutenberg. And as anyone unfortunate enough to play through Bethesda's new loading screen simulator knows, going bigger really means deeper. Luckily, neither Dragon's Dogma 2 or Starfield was to be the fate of Kingdom Come Deliverance 2. The wealth of information we've received from media figures, YouTubers with direct in-game experience, interviews with the devs, and the GamesCon showcase definitively shows that Warhorse, the developers of Kingdom Come Deliverance, have not only taken on our criticisms and leveled up nearly every aspect of the game, but, and this is why I decided to make this video, the approach they've taken to achieve this leveling up is a model example of how to develop a masterpiece as an an up and coming studio for the entire industry. You see, game development is a series of difficult trade offs. Even the most well resourced, high level studios find it difficult to implement new features without sacrificing a certain level of polish to develop risky new ideas and concepts. But for an indie or a smaller studio, it's virtually impossible. And as I demonstrated in more detail in this video I did a while back, and why mainstream game publications simply don't understand jank. This is where a lot of what we call jank comes from. It's a largely unavoidable byproduct of innovation. Studios have to decide, do we focus more on creating something distinct and interesting or creating something playable with the highest level of performance, playability, and ease of access. But, and I think Kingdom Come illustrates this, this janky phase is a necessary bump on the way to produce a masterpiece. You see, the vast majority of modern day masterpieces, your Baldur's Gate 3, your Elden Rings, your Skyrims, are now universally built on the foundation of experimental, janky games released before them. This is why Ubisoft games nowadays struggle to get past the 8 out of 10 label because they simply are afraid to take risks. 
to really sacrifice ease of access, mainstream appeal, and playability even in some areas to take a real gamble. And I believe that based on what we know, Warhorse is following the blueprint to create a masterpiece to a T. And I'm not just saying this based on what we've seen and heard, but also on how the developers have explained their methodology and how they've translated it into action. You see, Warhorse doesn't just see KCD2 as a sequel, but part of a much longer plan to realize the promise of the original they couldn't achieve with the limited resources they had access to at the time. The Dragon's Dogma 2 devs said the same thing, but it was clear from the town to the quest design that not much thought had gone into how to actually improve or stay true to the original past copy and paste in what was good about their previous game onto a much bigger scale. The best example of how Warhorse by contrast is following this blueprint to create a true masterpiece is the way they conceived of creating their first actual city Gutenberg. As PR head Tobias Stowe's villain said, we and Daniel Vavra always wanted to have a city in the game. And in KCD1, they're teasing and talking about how in Gutenberg something is happening, but we simply couldn't go there. Because we weren't able to have more than a few people on screen, the task of building a huge medieval city was too big. Now with more people and a cushion of a successful KCD1, we can make things bigger. Everyone always says it's going to be bigger and better, but in our case, we do have more people. We have the financial funding that can support the development, but we also have the technology and skills now to bring stuff into the game that we couldn't afford before. Why this is so impressive is it's clear from this statement that Kuttenberg wasn't pulled out of thin air to match the scale of other AAA games. Its existence was part of a concerted, long-term vision and was only developed when Warhorse knew they had the resources to actually execute this vision without sacrificing the other unique aspects of the KCD formula they already established. I noticed this pretty early on in the trailer when I came across what most people would regard as a fairly minor addition scaffolding. Scaffolding is not the sort of object that draws the eye, but its mere existence suggests that the developers, like any other dev from Larian to Bethesda who are trying to perfect a formula established in a previous game, have correctly identified what made the original so distinctive and found new and inventive ways to enhance that across the board. You see, most medieval inspired games, or games in general, exist in a static playground that is usually only altered through the course of the player's narrative or directly by our decisions but not in KCD. The original appeal of Henry's story in the first game was that he existed in a dynamic world, a world that existed before us and would be around after our intervention. Contrary to what you'd expect, existing as a small piece of a much wider and more dynamic world meant that when you were able to develop Henry from nothing to the beginnings of something, you felt a sense of satisfaction that's hard to describe. And the small details like scaffolding were fundamental to this dynamism. If Warhorse were a conventional AAA developer, they would have looked at what other big open world devs were doing with large cities and copied them, focusing less on small details barely anyone's going to notice, and more on ensuring it was a new menial map marker every five seconds. So the fact that they made sure the small details, like scaffolding, that made the much smaller world of the original so compelling still existed within the much larger world of Kuttenberg says everything about their overall approach. And I could show how their approach to quest design, interactivity, and combat shows this as well, but I don't want to repeat myself. I think you've got the point already. Many people have gone into the game's mechanics in far more interesting detail than I could, but that's not really the point of this video. It's to give Warhorse their plaudits as a studio. Their approach isn't just extremely well thought out and adventurous, but a blueprint for the game industry as a whole. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and let me know if you think I'm wrong. I'm always curious.